The Unshackled Waves, episode 205. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's been a busy week, both for me personally and in the news. We have been busy preparing for our latest and biggest live stream for the Victorian state election tomorrow night. We're aiming to put out an informative show for you. Elsewhere in Australian politics, we have seen Prime Minister Scott Morrison talk tough on immigration, signalling a cut in the annual intake, stripping citizenship from terrorists, and refusing to sign a US compact on migration. Gender is no longer being recorded on Tasmanian birth certificates unless it's requested under a bill passed by the state's lower house is the most radical LGBT law ever passed in Australia, but it is the blueprint of what we can expect from left-wing parties like the Labor Party and the Greens on these issues. Speaking of the Greens, despite their virtue signalling about being one of the most feminist parties in Australia, it turns out they are home to some of the worst sexual predators in politics, as numerous cases of sexual misconduct and harassment in the party have been revealed. So to discuss all this, I welcome back to the show, the political editor of The Unshackled, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now it's just you and I again. It was a bit difficult to manage all four of us on the, the last uh, review show that, that we did, but uh, this one, when it's just the two of us, it's <laughs> it's a bit easier, well, on my end to sort of manage. <laughs> yes. I am... Um... We should also give thanks to our friend Luke Isaac from That Guy Media, who has generously loaned me the use of his studio um, for today's podcast. Uh, yeah, look, the two of us are a lot easier to maintain than, you know, you, me, Damien and Steele, because we all have so much to say. But getting it all into one narrow podcast is eh, a little tricky. It was a popular episode, so it certainly, I think, was uh, worthwhile doing. But uh, enough small talk now. Let's get into the issues. Now, Scott Morrison announced this week that there'd be a... Well, he didn't say there would be a cut of 30000 from the annual migration intake of $190,000. He said there, there, there might be. Uh, it'll, it'll probably happen, which, in my opinion, uh, th- uh, th- this is basically the essence of his prime ministership, that we might might do something. We might move the embassy uh, in Israel. Uh, They still don't have a climate policy, but we'll magically find a way to make power bills uh, more affordable. So, but yeah, he, he said that this is this decisive action. It might happen. Mm, It might happen and pigs might fly as well, Tim. Now there are a couple of things I have to point out here. The suggestion of the likely cut from 190,000 intake to 160,000 intake, it seems to me to be, it's the right thing. It seems to be a good thing done for the wrong reasons. Because if you remember when Peter Dutton, the Home Affairs Minister came out and criticized the, um, the, the intake level as being too high, he got attacked by people in the government um, by Bishop and by um, by Scott Morrison. So you, you got to think, okay, what made him do a 160? I mean, I was quite, um, sorry, 160. What made him do a 180? I was, um, privately, I was quite scathing about that. Well, uh, I think the, that, is, yeah, the most important oh, sorry, thing, uh, I, I think, for Scott Morrison proposing this cut is that it's not... Uh, Tony Abbott's proposal, because let's not remember when Tony Abbott proposed cutting the migration intake from 190,000 to 110,000 uh, people per year. Scott Morrison said this would cripple the budget, and I don't remember Tony Abbott ever discussing this when I was Prime Minister. And so 30,000 mm. cut, it's it's not Tony Abbott's idea, so it's okay. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, well, it's, it's like, what was that thing in Animal Farm? When Snowball gets proposes an idea, then he gets overthrown by Napoleon, then Napoleon passes off Snowball's idea as his own, doesn't he? It's rank hypocrisy on the Prime Minister's part, and I hate saying that, but it really is rank hypocrisy. 
And I think the thing that needs to be remembered as well is that what they're talking about is the cap. The cap for immigration intake is 190,000. It's not the necessarily the amount of people we have coming in this year. Uh, Shadow Immigration Minister Tony Burke, who really is a Burke, if you ask my opinion, he made the comment, "Oh well, you know, this is just a this is just a cheap populist ploy because we're not even taking that many people anyway. So even if we do reduce to one hundred sixty thousand, it's not going to make a difference." So it's interesting that. The Labor Party would say that, considering the fact that, you know, it's usually the Labor Party who wants to push immigration, unfettered immigration, into our borders. Uh, well, Labor, they're in two minds, because the, the trade union uh, movement, they don't like skilled uh, migration, but then, of course, their left flank, they want uh, all of the, the refugees and asylum seekers to come in. They're, they're quite contradictory when it comes to uh, immigration. The, the main thing for them is they don't want to be seen as being uh, mean. That's, that's their uh, priority. But um, to, to call this a populist uh, measure that uh, that implies that uh, the government is doing this to uh, try and win some cheap votes when what they're doing is they're reacting to a public concern. I had Monica Wilkie from the the CIS on the the previous program where she talked about the the polling on immigration in relation to uh, infrastructure and uh, inter integration uh, and. Yeah, and she uh, agreed with me that yeah, the politicians have been slow to react. They, they, they've been the last to come to uh, come to actually want to do something on this issue, which is the opposite of of populism, where politicians are, are forced to react because of uh, uh, public. Uh, concern. Uh, so, so definitely, Scott Morrison. It was more a concession this week rather than than going out and saying, "Oh, this is what I'm going to do, and this is going to be really popular." Mm -hmm. Well, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive, do they? I mean, it is a popular pl a populist ploy to try and regain more votes, but at the same time, it's something that needs to be done. And that's why I said before, it's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, which kind of taints it in the grand scheme of things. Uh, perhaps I'm being unduly harsh, but it's it's the way it is. You know, you've got to have, you can't be doing things, you can't be making policy on the run based on knee-jerk reactions. You have to plan it carefully. You have to consult the people carefully. You have to listen to the people carefully. You can't just say, oh, for example, we've had an incident where a former refugee has gone berserk on Burke Street and then decide, now we're going to cut immigration now. It seems cheap. It seems illegitimate. It tarnishes what is otherwise a good measure. And that's why I'm being so harsh in this regard. But of course, this uh, cut in migration wasn't the, the only uh, policy around uh, immigration and citizenship that Scott Morrison announced this week. He also uh, an announced that uh, he wanted to strip the, the citizenship of convicted terrorists where it was possible. And he didn't just mean dual citizens, but also uh, citizens who could possibly get uh, citizenship of another country through their parents or grandparents. Now, uh, of course, if we can deport criminals and terrorists, make them someone else's problem, then yeah, I'm all for it. But if you're starting to get into, oh, well, they can get citizenship somewhere else and they haven't got it yet, then that's going to be a lot harder. For for example, if they if if they're entitled to say Iranian citizenship, for example, uh, I I don't think we can then uh, strip them of their citizenship, put them uh, on a plane to Iran, and Iran's going to be like, yeah, yeah, we'll grant uh, Australia's rejected you. Uh, we'll we'll grant you citizenship. <laughs> That's not how it's going to work. Mm, absolutely not. And I, I I will say I appreciate the intent of the policy, but the way they're structuring it is impractical. You can't strip citizenship from someone who only has one citizenship. If they're dual citizens, you can strip them Australian citizenship and declare them persona non grata. That is never welcomed again. But at the same time, if you've got someone like, let's say, because I have one citizenship only, I'm only an Australian. 
if if the government tried to strip me of Australian citizenship, they would not be able to because notwithstanding the fact that I have no other citizenship to claim or would want to claim because I love my country, it's just not legally tenable. You can't have stateless people. It's, it's just not possible under international law. And we would actually be failing our international obligations if we did that. Now I can hear the I can hear something. Yeah, who are people. you, a globalist? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, I can hear some people saying right now, "Oh, you 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 kowtow into international law by saying this," but no, it's not a matter of international law. It's a matter of decency. You can't just strip people of citizenship if they only have one citizenship. It's just not going to work. It's not going to work legally. It's. Uh, it, it, it's 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 very dangerous. Not that I don't appreciate the thrust of the policy. Like I said, it's very dangerous, and people need to think very carefully. The government, especially, needs to think very carefully about doing this. It's just not feasible. The way, at least the way you have outlined it, the the process you have given, it's just not feasible for the government to do. Again, this is another uh, ScoMo, I think, half-baked uh, policy because he's announced that you know he wants to be really tough in the in the wake of the the Burke Street terror attack and the the raids that we saw this week. But of course, there's a whole bunch of flaws in his in his policy, and this has been talked about for years: stripping uh, citizenship from uh, convicted uh, terrorists. But uh, it was even uh, discussed during the the Abbott years. But yet we haven't seen it come to fruition because of the the problems that that you outline there. So yeah, the the sentiment is obviously in in, in the right place, and it's yeah, it's it's a popular. Uh, this is a populist policy, but yeah, it, it's another thing. How are you going to make this work in practice? Mm. You can do it with dual citizens, dual citizens, absolutely, without any problem whatsoever. But you can't do it with um, people who have only one citizenship or people who only have Australian citizenship. Um, the only way you could possibly get around is, and I'm not a lawyer, so you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. But the only way you could do this in theory, to my understanding, and it's admittedly very limited on this matter, is if you uh, is citing the fact that they are entitled, convince the embassies in Canberra or wherever to take these citizens back, say, you know, we're stripping them of citizenship, but they're entitled to your citizenship. If you will give them asylum for whatever way you want to dress it up, that's the only way you could possibly do it. And even that is still very tenuous because like you said before correctly, Iran's not going to take back um, people entitled to Iranian citizenship just because the Australian government doesn't want them. Chances are the Iranian government doesn't want them. You think the Ayatollahs in Tehran want them? No, they don't. And the other thing that Scott Morrison did on immigration this week is he refused to sign the, the United Nations Compact on uh, Migration, rightly, because mm -hmm. he, he was worried about how our courts would interpret it, the, uh, uh, that the critics of Australia's immigration system, how they'd be able to use that to, to whack Australia and as many uh, international bodies as, as possible and also undermine our strong border security arrangement. And the, the US uh, didn't sign it either. Now Labor, they've uh, promised to, to sign it. But yeah, this was a, a good uh, policy decision because what, what are the UN going to do if you're not, you're not going to sign it? They're just going to say, oh, you're a bad, a bad man. But the consequences for signing it is that, as I mentioned just before, you enable all these international bodies to chip away your border security. Exactly right. The UN will write, will get very, very angry and write us an angry letter telling us how angry they are. But in all seriousness, though, I will give a lot of credit to Scott Morrison for refusing to sign this compact because it's just, it's, it's, it's abhorrent. It's, it's morally and nationally abhorrent. I mean, the thing is, we already have 
a very, very generous refugee intake program, uh, despite what the mainstream media might say. We take in so many more refugees per capita than pretty much any other country in the world. We also, except for, with the possible exception of John Howard, after the Tampa crisis, who, when he made his famous "We will decide who comes here and in, and the manner in which they come" speech, we don't use Article Thirty Two, for example, which allows us to turn people away even if they are later on classified as refugees on the grounds of national security. You know, I mean, the thing with the UN compact is that it, now I have to read through all the text of the compact itself, but it does seem to, from my understanding, does seem to supersede Article 32 and, or at least render it, um, null and void in the case of, you know, let's have open borders for everyone. I don't think this is a, a bigger vote winner as some conservative commentators are making. Rowan Dean said, oh, yeah, this is going to win Scott Morrison the next election. But I think in reality, <laughs> all, all, Scott, all, all Scott Morrison is making sure is that uh, the, the status quo and border security is maintained. The, the public will like it, but they'll they'll move on to the next thing. So it's a good good decision, but uh, it's certainly not a not a game changer. It's just making sure that things are the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. It's not turning back the tide. It's resisting the tide. It's holding it back. It's not turning it back. Now the other significant news item that, uh, that was of national importance was came out of Tasmania where they've decided to make gender on birth certificates opt in. So basically what will happen is the the midwife, mid, oh, I shouldn't say midwife, mid person will ask the, <laughs> the uh, parents, uh, would you like your child's gender on the birth certificate? So what, what, what is the doctor also going to say now? They, uh, are they not allowed to say it's a boy, it's a girl? Are they just meant to say it's a thing? This is the most absolutely fucking retarded thing I've ever seen come out of Tasmania. I, I'm just going to put it out there. It's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for losing my temper and using poor language here, but it's, what do you mean opt in? It should be an opt out thing. If you're going to say, oh, do you want gender on your birth certificate, on your kid's birth certificate, it should be opt out, not opt in. So, yeah. you know, we're going to classify. It's biology. There are two genders. Deal with it. And how does a baby know if they're non-binary as the, the, or gender fluid as, that, as that's the sort of new civil rights frontier of the, the LGBT lobby? Exactly. I mean, babies don't know anything. They're babies. Let them be babies. I mean, yes, you can say parents can decide for them, but come on. You can't argue with biology. You're born either a man or a woman. And it's that simple. You and most... know, if they, if they want to change later on, fine. Do whatever. But don't say that, you know, oh, I was born with male genitalia, but I identify as a woman. Or, you know, what, a few hours old? Come on. And... I should point out that uh, basing sex and gender on genitalia at birth, that does have a 99% uh, success rate. So I judge that it's it's been a pretty good system. Well, exactly. It makes sense. And what a lot of people don't understand is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. More to the point, more to the point, Tim, it, it just, you know, it's, hundreds if not thousands of years of practice you recognized as a boy or a girl if you want to change later on fine just don't do it now you know and give them the choice now apparently sex will still be recorded on medical records so doctors can still do their job because let's not remember that men and women are biologically different and have different medical uh, requirements so uh, it's mm. it hasn't gone on that far but the the main but what was also passed uh, in this legislation is that uh, you only 
your self-identification for your gender is all that's needed now. So you basically need to uh, turn up to the Office of Birth, Deaths and Mar Marriages with a stat deck saying, oh, I'm now, I'm now a woman and you can get it changed uh, just like that. And there's also now hate speech laws in Tasmania that uh, you, if you misgender somebody, that's a hate crime. Oh, for goodness sake. I have a friend of mine I went to uni with. When I met her... He used to be something, she used to be a guy, and I was good friends with this guy. A few years later, he decided to transition and become a female. And then, so he became she, you know, and, you know, I, I acknowledge that choice. I don't agree with that choice, but I acknowledge that choice, and it's what my friend wanted. So, but even for me, when I see her, I still default to the name when I want to salute him, like say hi to him, her, sorry. See, you see how, you do, how difficult it is? You know, you know someone, then they transition. You still have the default of, of who they were before the person they became now. You know, you, you greet them as their first name, their birth name, and then you remember, oh, wait, new name. You know, it's not, it's not a hate crime. It's innocent, for goodness sake. It's not like it's malicious. No, after I'm, the Human Rights Commission with you. After the right Human Rights Commission with me? Come on. If I want to be malicious, I'm, the last thing I'm going to do is call some, is deliberately misgender someone. I've got plenty, I've got much more of an extensive vocabulary than resorting to, oh, you're a, you think you're a girl, but you're a guy, or vice versa. Come on. If I really want to be insulting or malicious to someone, I'm not going to insult them by misgendering them. I've got many more colourful ways of doing so. Come on. You know? It's not a malicious thing. It's just... It's a force of habit for people who know them. And the people who have transitioned, they understand that. It's all these... It's all these activists and snowflakes who want to get upset about something just because they want to be offended by something. Get over it! They're not offended. Why should you be? Now, this was passed by the Greens and Labour, plus the, the Liberal Speaker only got there because she ratted on her party, uh, because the, the the Tasmanian Liberal government has a one-seat uh, majority, uh, so it was able to pass with, with her uh, support. But it basically this signifies because the the local lgbt lobby said that this is a benchmark for laws nationwide it pretty much means that labor and the greens will go uh, along with any demand by these extreme lgbt lobby groups and so we'll see well we've got the victorian election here uh if daniel andrews gets back in he'll probably try uh such a law there's uh if labor gets in in new south wales uh, they'll probably try and uh, do that now and you'd think there'd sort of be ordinary people in the labor party at least that would say hey this is ridiculous but they all want to to please and get the votes of these uh, lgbt groups and so they just say yep we'll give you whatever you want no matter how ridiculous it is to the public mm -hmm. and it should also be noted that there's a silent but significant minority maybe not the majority but a certainly sizable minority within the labor party who think these laws are absolutely stupid uh, you know i mean i have plenty of friends in the labor party who say look identity politics has just gone way too far we don't want this we don't need this it just makes us look stupid and it gives the right ammunition to use against us but they don't say anything at the party level publicly because they are afraid of the repercussions from factional enemies of their of theirs and also the activists who have hijacked the hierarchy and administration of the Labour Party. Our next topic is uh, rapey greens. Now, this refers to a number of uh, sexual misconduct allegations that have been levelled at uh, MPs and, and greens officials. This began with a 7.30 segment on the New South Wales Greens mishandling sex misconduct alle allegations. That was back in August. We've also seen the former Victorian Greens leader, Greg Barber, uh, refer to... Uh, 
other Greens women as fat, hairy lesbians, power pussies, and hairy legged feminists. And he also had a men's room in his uh, electorate office where uh, no women were allowed. They had to ask permission. Well, <laughs> you and I think that men's faces are, uh, are not not a bad thing, but remember, this is a this is a Green and New South yeah, Wales exactly. <laughs> New South Wales Greens MP Jerry Jeremy Buckingham. He's been accused of an act of uh, sexual violence. He was cleared by an internal Greens investigation, but fellow Greens uh, MP Jenny Leong said he should uh, step down uh, and sp spelled out the allegations under parliamentary pl privilege, which was pretty big for a Green to turn on another Green under the cloak of parliamentary uh, privilege. Then uh, we've had the, the Greens candidate in Footscray, Angus McAlpine. He was a rapper. He rapped about uh, date rape uh, uh, and uh, having... Uh, lots of casual sex with uh, women, and he also had uh, homophobic uh, lyrics. Uh, now the Greens have stood by him saying, oh, that was a number of years ago. He's, he's left the, the toxic masculinity and the, uh, the music industry. And then we've had the candidate for, for Sandringham, Dominic Phillips. He'd liked a number of Facebook pages. One was period pains, try waiting for your porn to download, twinkle, twinkle, little slut, name one guy you haven't fucked, and I'd like to swim in the ocean for you, old jokes, I'd get my turban wet. And this guy, he has just been disendorsed as the, the Greens candidate for Sandringham because he was named as the Greens candidate who was uh, subjected to a, a rape allegation, which was submitted to the Greens state director. Now, of course, this all this reaffirms what we already knew, that uh, male feminists, uh, uh, they are always the, the biggest uh, sexual predators, it turns out. Mm -hmm. Well, credit where credit's due to the Greens, they did the right thing in disendorsing um, Phillips. I mean, I haven't had the chance to look at those pages yet, but they sound abhorrent just from the title. Actually, you know what? I don't even need to look at the pages that were mentioned in mainstream and also alt media outlets. It's just, <laughs> the hypocrisy is staggering. You, on the one hand, you have Sarah Hansen Young calling out David Leyenhelm for, and I quote, slut shaming. And on the other hand, you've got the Greens covering up, you know, conduct from Angus McAlpine, who, along with the lyrics you mentioned, also talks about choking bitches. Mm, so, yeah. Yeah, it's like, was... lovely. You want this guy in your parliament as a role model for your kids? Nah. <laughs> and Foot Footscray <laughs> is a is a you. seat in inner Melbourne that the Greens think that they've got somewhat of a chance in. So he's not like Sandringham, for example, they were never going to win that. It's a safe Liberal seat. But Footscray is an inner Melbourne seat. I mean, they, they, they could be in with a chance with that. And that's the guy they've selected. Mm -hmm. Just goes to show you that the that even the One Nation Party have a better vetting process than the Greens, doesn't it? I mean, if anyone votes for the if anyone honestly and unironically votes for the Greens after this, you you, you need your head red, mate. It's that simple. I mean, voting for the Greens after their selection of such appalling candidates, so not even dubious, just outright degenerate candidates. It's like, no, nah. no, just, just, just no, you, you do not deserve any votes at all. And former uh, Green Senator, uh, communist uh, Lee Rhiannon, she uh, compared the, the culture of um, se uh, sexual misconduct against uh, women and the cover-up to what went on in the, the churches with regard to so child sexual abuses. And that's a pretty strong statement that the, the, the culture in the party is that bad. Because uh, remember that the Greens, they aim to be the, the party t that... Uh, wants to project the, the feminist image the most. So we care about, you know, women. We have heaps of uh, fe female MPs. We care about violence against women. We're against toxic masculinity. That's the image they want to project. But of course, they, they want to cover anything up. Uh, uh, screw the, the, the women who have had uh, wrong done to them. It's, it's more important their image, not the actual of practicing what you preach. Hmm, exactly. Do as I say, not do as I do. 
And the Greens have been notorious for being the biggest proponents of the, you know, believe her, hashtag believe her, mm. when, you know, they've got all this stuff going on in their cesspool. So, you know, are we going to build, are we going to build, so, you know, now that the, now that your guys are being accused of sexual impropriety, are you going to believe the accusers or are you going to dig in and double down behind the guys who are accused? Hmm, I wonder. It's just rank hypocrisy from the Greens, as always. And it's been used by Labour in the, the Victorian election campaign to attack the Greens. There's this uh, mm -hmm. website that's been put up, authorised by Labour, uh, Greens Info, which uh, not just details all this, but all the other internal stuff that's gone on the Greens. Remember their failed candidate for the Batman by-election, Alex Patel, well, it was their sixth loss in, in Batman. She was uh, accused of being a bully, a branch stacker. Uh, her campaign was, was sabotaged by factional uh, enemies. And uh, there was also the, the candidate they had to disendorse because uh, she confessed to and endorsed uh, shoplifting. Shoplifting. Of... <laughs> so, and you have to remember that you know, the, the Greens, they're, they're one of the media class's favourite political parties, yet this is all that's, uh, this has still managed to, to come out. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to make a quip before about the fact that, well, the Greens like to steal, of course, they endorse a shoplifter. <laughs> but yeah, look, there are some things that even the mainstream media cannot turn a blind eye to. Most of the time, the mainstream media... Uh, it takes a we don't want to know approach. We're not going to publish anything till we're one hundred percent sure approach. But then when it does come out, it's like oh, we're going to criticize them. We're going to criticize them. They're, they're, it's, their, it's their attempt to look objective. It's their attempt to look, you know, somewhat reasonable. Now the polls open for the Victorian election at eight a.m. Uh, Saturday, but nearly forty percent of voters have already cast their vote. There's been record early voting. Now, Michael, you're not able to be on our live stream uh, tomorrow night, so we'll get your uh, views and predictions for the Vic election on uh, today's show. Now we've had two polls that have uh, just come out for the Victorian election: the Galaxy poll in News Court, which has Labour ahead 53-47 and a reach tell Fairfax poll which has Labour ahead 54-46 which puts Labour in a pretty strong position to uh, get re-elected uh, Daniel Andrews to win uh, a second term. Mm -hmm. And God help Victoria. Um, look, I think the polls, the polls usually have a two, one to two points margin of error so you know even factoring the margin of error it still looks like Labour's going to win I honestly think and I hate to say this I really do but I honestly think Labour will hold on just simply be, even though they do not deserve to retain power the Liberal Party has not done enough to demonstrate to the Victorian electorate that it deserves a chance to fix up Andrew's mistakes which is a shame because Matthew Guy's actually a decent bloke, but he doesn't have the killer instinct. He doesn't yeah. have the sheer bastardry that is required to be a thriving politician, let alone a leader of government. Probably what works against him, and this is a, a real uh, shallow analysis, but he is a very small guy, and so when he's trying to uh, project a tough guy image, he, he comes across as quite a, a pipsqueak, and that's, I think, how a lot of Victorians see him, is, oh, he's, he, he's just a, a tryhard, where if you look at somebody like Jeff Kennett, the, uh, the uh, last uh, uh, successful uh, Victorian uh, premier, he was a you know strong, imposing you know figure. He could you know, e he could easily smash Labor, uh, be re uh, be really uh, intimidating, ruthless. He projected that image, and I just don't see that in Matthew Guy. That is a very shallow analysis, Tim. <laughs> but it's how people vote. Unfortunately, it's how people vote. I, I know, I know. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. Don't misunderstand me. He does. 
he, he does come off as someone who, unfortunately for him, I, I like, like I said, I like the guy, but he doesn't come off as someone who is very strong and he doesn't come off as someone who has the killer instinct. And that's his biggest flaw. That's his, uh, his fatal flaw, I guess you'd say, is that he doesn't, sound, he doesn't seem, uh, ironically, he doesn't seem masculine enough. Um, which is funny, given that it's in Victoria. Look, uh, in regards to the how, um, not the House of Reps, the Legislative Assembly, I do suspect that I am leaning towards Labour holding on to power. Maybe not by as many seats as they did previously, but I do predict Labour will win um, in the Legislative Assembly. The Legislative Council, however will be interesting to watch simply because you've got a wide gamut of parties. In some regions, you have more than 50 candidates running for contesting those regions. You've yeah, got... yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. I just want to focus on, I, I do agree that Labour uh, is likely to be re-elected. The only path to, to victory for the uh, Liberals is its its term winning the the marginals uh, along the, the the Frankston line and also in the the Casey uh, area such as Cranbourne and the Narry Warren seats. That's where uh, the Liberals uh, tough on crime, uh, stopping the waste and rorts. That's where their message can be really effective. And there's uh, up to eight seats in those areas, and so that's enough to give the Liberals government, even if there is a, a, sw a swing against them, uh, Labor wins the two-party preferred vote. But that's that's their only way to, to victory. But yeah, getting to the Legislative Council, they still have um, group voting tickets here in Victoria, which allows minor and micro parties to, to preference each other before the, the majors and uh, makes it so that Glenn Drury can still work his magic <laughs> in all the, all the preference uh, deals, which which is going to throw up uh, some parties we've never heard of, such as the Aussie Battler Party, the Sustainable Australia Party, and the Transport Matters Party. <laughs> well, the Sustainable Australia Party is basically the um, the successor to the stable um, the stable population party. Um, the Aussie Battler Party is actually the main leading candidate is a guy called Vern Hughes, who used to be DLP, Democratic Labour Party, back in, um, back when the DLP was actually a major force. Um, he has friendships with the country party, um, even with ALA, God knows why. But the thing with the minor party alliance that they tried to build in Victoria for the Victorian election is that, <laughs> It's problematic in some ways because you have the ALA preferencing the Victorian socialists above the Liberal Party. Like, why would you do that? Yes, I get the whole preference all minors before the majors. I get that. Yeah, if but you're preferencing certain... the Victorian socialists above the Liberal Party and other parties are preferencing them as well, they're ultimately going to have their vote trickle back to the Labour Party despite whatever algorithms yeah, there, there's there's certain going part minor parties you still put last. Uh, Victorian socialists you mentioned, the, the Animal Justice Party. So... so... There, there's certain. I, I know that in preference deal, you have to uh, make deals with parties you have a lot of disagreement uh, with. But yeah, there, there, you, you you have to take certain principal decisions. And yeah, it, uh, preferencing animal justice or Victorian socialists if you're a right of centre party, that's it's it's going to come back to to bite you. Mm, 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 absolutely, and. It's going to demonstrate to other parties that you can't be trusted. And it's, and you know, some people come back and say, oh, we don't owe them anything. Why should we preference them if they don't preference us? That's not the point. You do the right thing. You do all the right thing ideologically. You have acceptable parties and you have unacceptable parties. You put the major party of what you consider to be the lesser of two evils as at the bottom of the acceptable parties, and then you put the unacceptable parties, making sure you put Labour and the Greens dead last, in, in our case, obviously. Now, the 
issues of the the campaign well it's more about what the the parties are promising uh daniel andrews is just spending heaps on on free stuff he's promised uh uh free uh tampons in schools for girls free dental uh checkups a a free hamper for new uh parents for their baby uh and he's also uh just today promised a free breakfast and and lunch for uh students uh in in schools as well so basically it seems that well, uh, Daniel Andrews is trying to extend the, the safe schools program to basically, well, we've taken care of that part of parenting. Let's see how much we can replace parents further by doing all the things that they should be doing or used to uh, do. And of course, uh, this is costing millions and millions of dollars. Labor's election promises have been costed at $26 billion over mm. 10 years, which is, for a state government, that's uh, a lot. The Liberals have tried to talk about uh, crime, law and order, and also the the waste on, on infrastructure projects, because let's not remember the $1 billion Daniel Andrews sp uh, spent at the beginning of his uh, term to not uh, build a road. Um, mm. But yeah, we've... Uh, we've We've talked about before why the Liberals are, are not cutting tr through. And then there's also all the uh, the, the red shorts wrought. Uh, that hasn't had an impact. And the, the recent terror attack hasn't had an impact. Uh, Labour is looks like it's cruising for a victory, which begs the question, is Victoria naturally left-wing or is it's just the Liberals? They've just done a poor campaign. I think it's a bit of both. I mean, the Liberals haven't had a strong campaign since Kennett was Premier. And the Liberals don't have the backbone anymore. They don't, they've, they've lost their bottle, as it were. Whereas the Labour Party has a bottle or several and just says, we're going to do this, deal with it, makes no apologies, doesn't acknowledge any of its wrongdoing, of which there is much. And it says, this is what we're doing, deal with it, gets things done for right or wrong. And people are like, well, you know, at least we know what we've got. It, it, it's tragic. But I think if people who haven't voted yet vote for Labour and all the Greens on Saturday, if they do that tomorrow, then they're idiots and they deserve whatever's, whatever they get. Well, as the old saying goes, they're the only poll that matters in election day. So even though the polls mm. are indicating uh, a Labour uh, victory and uh, quite a fractured uh, upper house, so even if Daniel Andrews does get back in, he'll have all these uh, micro parties to, to deal <laughs> with, which, <will> make, <laughs> uh, which, he, which he won't uh, like. But yeah, uh, we won't know until... Uh, tomorrow night for um, our live stream, but uh, yeah, those are those are our predictions. If you if you want to see us uh, analyze uh, things on the night, make sure you you stick around on on Facebook and YouTube live. But thanks, Michael, for for coming back on the show uh, this week. As I mentioned, it's been quite a chaotic week for for me and for and for you. But it's good that we we made time to to do this uh, roundup episode. My pleasure, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Our Victorian election night live stream starts at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, and it will be on Facebook and YouTube Live. In the Unshackled studio will be my all-star alt-media panel, which will be The Young Conservative, uh, David Hiscock and Maddie Roses from XYZ, and Mangus O'Mallon. The Deplorables Tour featuring Gavin McGuinness and Tommy Robinson is happening next month. They're visiting all the major cities, Sydney, Melbourne, Gold Coast, Adelaide and Perth. If you haven't got your hands on a ticket yet, then good news is you can still go and get one by going to the tour website, which is thedeplorables.com.au. We've also relaunched our online store, Upright Market. It has some new products, such as our It's Not Okay To Be Green shirt, which has been selling well, as well as other humorous ones. So make sure you check out the new range by going to uprightmarket.com. Also, as always, we can only continue to produce what we do at The Unshackled with your support. Uh, so the best form of support is, of course, becoming a patron over at Patreon. And our Patreon link is patreon.com slash The Unshackled. We also have a PayPal me link where you can send us a direct one-off contribution, which you can find by going to PayPal me slash The Unshackled. We haven't been banned from the platform yet, so definitely helping us go a long way. So thanks once again for for your company and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.